All right, I'm gonna start. Okay, um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, I just want to welcome all of the attendees uh, for coming to tonight's event. Her minor again forever. Um, to mark the closing of Paige KB's exhibition, Chapter 33, Kaj has invited filmmaker, artist, writer, and academic Heather Warren Crow to read excerpts from her book, Girlhood and the Plastic Image, which argues that fundamental qualities of the digital image, namely mutability, scalability, and shareability, are also associated with girlishness, with the power and vulnerability of girls as they are discursively understood. The author and the artist and writer, Paige KB, will then discuss the themes of Warren Crow's research and key points of the book as they relate to KB's exhibition at Kaj. Heather Warren Crow is a filmmaker, artist, and writer based in Lubbock, Texas. Her work across performance art, video art, and experimental film foregrounds the voice and plays with sound image relations. She has exhibited her work in galleries and in performance spaces, on screens and on stages in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, El Salvador, India, Japan, Mexico, Tanzania, Taiwan, Trinidad and Tobago, and across Europe and the United States. Recent film festivals include the Barcelona Short Film and Video Festival, the Mimesis Documentary Festival, and the Oregon Documentary Film Festival, which gave her film Recapture a Best Experimental Microfilm Award in 2021. She's the author of the academic book, Girlhood and the Plastic Image, and co-author of Young Girls in Echo Land, hashtag theorizing Tekken, uh, recently published by the University of Minnesota Press. Paige KB is an artist, writer, and editor who lives and works in New York. Recent exhibitions include a solo project at Lubov, a group show at Theta, and an installation at Canal Research Association that developed into a collaboration with Shanzai Lyric at MoMA PS1 for the Greater New York uh, 2021 adventure. Uh, her work has appeared across numerous publications for nearly a decade, including Freeze, Viscose Spike and Art Forum, where she was editor, was an editor from 2014 to 2018. And her first book, a monographic essay on the art of Selen Roca, was published by Matthew Marx this year. She's currently doing research for a new long-form essay on the artist Jay Chung and Q Takeki Maeda's Bad Driver and will participate in a group exhibition at the Brothauser Society of America opening this Sunday, May 22nd. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Heather Warren Crow. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. I'm really happy to be here and I'm psyched to be returning to my book, Girlhood and the Plastic Image. I mentioned before that uh, I haven't reread my work very often. Some of this I haven't reread at all since, since uh, publishing it. So it's a real treat for me. And especially to hear about how Paige has made use of these words for her own work. Uh, Paige asked me to read specific excerpts from the book. So uh, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start with the preface. It's a good place to start. I'm gonna read a short excerpt from one single page and then the opening of a chapter that deals um, primarily with the anime film Paprika, which is a totally awesome film and I would highly recommend it. Um, but the preface lays out in kind of an oblique way some of my interests and concerns for the book. If you see me looking down, I've got the book and hard copy here, hardcover. All right, Girlhood in the Plastic Image, the preface. Lev Manovich's now canonical book, The Language of New Media, begins with a surprising revelation. The avant-garde masterpiece, Man with a Movie Camera, completed by Russian director Ziga Vertov in 1929, will serve as our guide to the language of new media. 
and that's a quote. Manovich's argument is that, quote, cinematic ways of seeing the world have become the basic means by which computer users access and interact with all cultural data, end quote. End quote. New media are essentially, but not entirely cinematic, he claims, and Vertov's work in particular prefigures the database imagination that would later produce digital objects from websites to 3D, 3D CGI animations and computer games. Moreover, man with the movie camera's double exposures and other special effects, including its recursive opening shot of the man hauling his titular machine up a mound of dirt, all perched atop a gargantuan movie camera, anticipate the primacy of digital compositing through layer-driven software applications such as Photoshop and After Effects. While Manovich's reliance on cinema to establish much of the fundamental vocabulary of new media is critiqued by those concerned about the loss of specificity or troubled by the subsumption of film within narratives of new media's development, the language of new media is still an off-sided primer on the formal properties of the digital. In fact, my own book makes use of his notion of variability, one of five so-called principles that Manovich offers to distinguish new and old media despite their many continuities. A new media object, or more particular to my book, a digital image, is not something fixed once and for all, but something that can exist in multiple, potentially infinite versions. That's a quote from Manovich. Although I did not set out to write a rejoinder to the language of new media, I now realize that girlhood and the plastic image is in one way a kind of inadvertent but needy reimagining, conjuring a different avatar for an exploration of variability, multiplicity, potentiality, and infinity in digital image culture. What if our guide were not man with a movie camera, but the character Alice in Wonderland? How does her transmedia nature as a figure visualized through photography, literature, illustration, philosophy, game design, and yes, also cinema, shift the terms through which we make sense of the digital condition? How can she expand Manovich's cinematic rubric? How might she redirect other pivotal concepts in media theory and visual culture studies toward the role of identity in the cultural logic of media, or as I prefer the cultural rhetoric? How is a girl falling through a rabbit hole different from a man ascending a mountainous camera? While these questions are influenced by the Technorati's enduring fascination with Carroll's novel, I turn slightly away from Marshall McLuhan's declaration that, quote, Lewis Carroll greeted the electronic age of space time with a cheer, end quote, and Ivan Sutherland's vision of a computer interface that could literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. In other words, girlhood in the plastic image is moved not by the author or the world, but by Alice herself, her, uh, her ability to use and withstand consumption as an activator of transformation, her capacity and imperative to change to suit different media and mediums, her stubborn engagement with problems of scale. Alice points us toward key attributes of digital images, malleability, transmediation, and instability. Furthermore, and this will become clear as the book proceeds, she encourages the formation of a congruent theory of plastic identity. The contemporary aesthetic subject, I argue, is a creature of variable scale and format modeled after the morphing, mobile, and girlish digital image. This book is not about Alice in Wonderland, but about what she can help us understand. A minor can tell us something about digitality that a mister with a movie camera cannot. Okay, so throughout the book, I return to Alice in Wonderland as this kind of touchstone figure um, where I find the elements of the digital image in this obviously pre-digital, or I like to think of it as proto-digital work of literature and film, et cetera, with the many adaptations. Okay, so I'm gonna now go to page eight of the first chapter. Uh, okay, this is a really brief excerpt um, from page eight. Many of the case studies in this book were produced during a turn of the century moment that witnessed the often celebratory heyday of digital mutability as a scholarly paradigm. 
More importantly, though, it is necessary for us to revisit and refine the given assumptions of the late 90s and early 2000s, although it may be tempting for us to match the fast pace of technological change by continually searching for new keywords. When Oliver Grau and Thomas Weigel state the obvious, quote, the digital image represents endless options for manipulation, end quote, as they did in 2011, we must respond with a close examination of endlessness and manipulability as the promises of the digital image. The central argument of this book is not only that these are the promises and premises of the digital. More pressingly, I claim that these attributes are not gender neutral. While other aspects of image culture are rigorously interrogated in relation to identity, so take gaze theories, uh, exegesis of classical Hollywood cinema, for example, or the feminist critique of anti-theatrical prejudice, digital scalability and lability are not given the same kind of attention. What if we were to become sensitive to the dynamics of power inherent to the axiomatic attributes and functions of the digital image? What modes of identification are facilitated or hindered by endlessness and manipulability? My proposition advanced throughout this book's four chapters is that our operative notions of image plasticity are entwined with conceptions of the plasticity of girls. In other words, Manovich's principle of variability is an embrace of girlishness with all the disturbing and enabling implications of the word embrace. Okay. So that was from the first chapter, which was sort of the introduction after the preface, introduces the, um, the terms of the book, the obsessions of, of the book. And uh, I'm gonna move to just the very beginning of chapter four, which is called Exporting Girlishness. And this is a chapter that is, as I mentioned earlier, largely about the um, animated film Paprika, um, but deals with other anime as well. Okay. So I wasn't gonna read the quotations that open this chapter. I think I will because I like them. So I, I think that they're relevant. So the first is from um, Tamaki Saito, Beautiful Fighting Girl, it's the name of the book. Otaku cannot resist the temptation to fiddle with fictional sexuality, reversing, recombining, and otherwise reshaping it into endless variations. In this sense, the beautiful fighting girl is a remarkable invention of otaku bricolage. Her universality as an icon is a demonstrable fact. She has propagated herself all over the world through the internet and the seeds of a new generation are sprouting everywhere. Um, and this is a discussion, uh, part of a discuss discussion of the beautiful fighting girl genre of anime, which is my favorite genre. Okay, and also from the same book, um, the young girl in anime is always in the position of catalyzing some kind of emergent change. I love that quote. Uh, and then the next one and the final one is from Grant McCracken's um, book, Transformations, Identity, Construction, and Contemporary Culture. And the quote is, entertainment is dead, long live transformation. All right. So despite, or rather because of the proliferation of animation on the internet, GIFs, flash animations, etc., and at art galleries, the movie house and the home theater remain remarkably generative sites for the consumption of plastic images. The expansion of animation outside its traditional environments assists the global dissemination of cinematic and televisual formats. With anime, the accessibility of contextual information, the vast amount of official and peer-to-peer -peer expertise available on the internet, not to mention the ease with which even obscure animation can be purchased through online commerce, gives Japanese cartoons a secure foothold in markets outside of Japan. An anime feature encountered on television can sometimes be rewatched whole or in part on YouTube, which might offer a sidebar list of related videos that includes anime influenced video art and most more likely Japanese television serials, in turn motivating dedicated viewers, that is otaku, to locate fan websites, attend screenings of Japanese exports at the local Cineplex and buy anime on Blu-ray from amazon.com. Some of these otaku make and share their own anime remixes, fan dubs, or fan fiction, and thus become multipliers. Grant McCracken's term for prosumers who participate in collective acts of construction and use his or her, <clears throat> excuse me, and use their instruments and networks to publicize their efforts. 
A small but active subsection of multipliers joins the Organization for Transformative Works, a group committed to protecting the rights of fans to create their own pieces using copyrighted characters or fantasy worlds. It takes its name from the legal distinction between a plagiarized and a derivative work. The latter is metamorphosis, the former stealing. Okay. And it goes on to talk about this transformational turn in uh, image consumption where, where consumers are creating works based on or using elements of what they consume as opposed to simply just kind of viewing or listening, which I'm sure we are all very, very familiar with. Okay, so those are some excerpts from the book Girlhood and the Plastic Image. Uh, it deals with uh, digital image culture most generally, but I'm really excited about thinking through anime as, uh, as a, a kind of window into a broader digital image culture that is a culture of sharing and creating images um, in circulation. Uh, Paige, I have some questions for you. I don't know if you wanna respond directly to these, uh, these excerpts or we should, we should go forth with my questions. I actually we... was interested then to sort of like, if you, if you would sort of start us like with the, with the first question you had, I feel like that would be a really good prompt for me. Um, Great. I've been, I've been reading, rereading parts of the book. So it's all kind of, there's so many sort of small points and touchstones that, you know, it'd be, I'd love it if you would sort of like ground me, root me. Sure, I will. Yeah, I would love to do that. And, you know, my first question is actually kind of taking us away from the content of the book. For some reason, I, I, I seem to want these days to think about form and then move into contact, content. So I was, mm -hmm. in reading this book, I was reminded of the form of the book that I was writing. This is an academic press book. It has a particular form. But in the course of writing this book, I thought very deeply about how I might write girliness kind of into existence, how, what writing girliness might be. This book is a book about girliness and it does not actually do much um, with the form of the book to write girliness. But I have a subsequent book that really took a lot of the themes from Girlhood in the Plastic Image and uh, tried to maybe put my money where my mouth was and adopt a kind of format that allowed writing girliness to happen. And in looking at your work page, I was struck by how many forms of writing you have in, in your work. I mean, you're not only a writer and you publish um, text, but I'm thinking in terms of the visual artworks, um, you have the thank you stamps and the, you have pencil drawing, there's musical notation at one point. Um, there's painting, of course, where you have text, there's collage with pieces of paper. Um, there's embroidery, which uh, Paige and I earlier had a conversation about how people always want to interpret that as women's work, embroidery, and how we might uh, kind of, she prompted me think otherwise about it. And I started thinking about the embroidery as an, a form of writing that maybe what we're thinking of it, not in a typical way as women's work, but as a form of writing, how, how might that um, what might that open up about the work? And so for me, it's, it's this idea of writing girliness into existence. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts on how the text that you put into your artworks is a form of writing girliness or girlishness of girly. I was told once that girliness is an offensive word and I was actually asked to take it out of the book. I think at one point, I think I replaced it with girlishness in the mm -hmm. book because yeah the reviewer was really offended by it and then and then in the next book I put it back in so anyway I'm sorry if I offended anyone with I want to reclaim girliness anyway I'm off on a on a tangent so mm -hmm. thoughts on that Paige um well the way I think a lot of the writing in terms of its presence in my work is kind of I think of it as collation often mm -hmm. is a word I would use to describe it um even if I'm authoring the text I'm also interested in making it look maybe as if it came from elsewhere, putting it with things that do come from elsewhere, mm -hmm. or if it's if it's handwriting, uh, it might be something that I didn't write, but mm -hmm. I'm interested in this kind of trope that if you see something handwritten, there's a sort of um, immediate kind of association or read of it as personal, mm -hmm. um, which can be done in good faith and it can be done in bad faith as well. Um, there's handwriting on a particular work in, in the front of the show, um, which uses this technique of dry point, um, which is 
a traditional printmaking technique mm -hmm. where you scratch into usually a substrate, a matrix with a diamond tip needle. Um, but that text is just, are just excerpts of omens from the Iliad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nothing particularly personal about that per se. Um, it's something very old. Um, and it's something that doesn't, that, you know, is, is linked to an authorship of Homer, but again, um, authorship, that form of authorship is, a uh, you know, classically debated and, um, you know, not, not certain. And that's not necessarily the point of that story anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm often interested, I think, in kind of attempting to sort of tangle and untangle and maybe conflict and sort of extricate and br or bring together different vo voices, this idea mm -hmm. of voice, the narrative voice. This idea of a singular voice and an individual speaking um, is something that I want to complicate. I think in the writing and this idea of kind of narration as cultural rather than personal or individualistic. Um, so that was something that I wanted to allude to with that particular excerpt. Um, but I think of it, yeah, as this idea of, you know, particularly in terms of contemporary art and through visual art, um, a lot of it is received through text mm -hmm. and, and through writing about works and through criticism. And I think that's become in the last, you know, say like a post-conceptualism, after conceptualism, text is very much an important part of work, not only visually, but also in terms of its distribution. Um, you know, what, what's been said about say, you know, Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty is really the, you know, the avenue through which most people will experience it, you know, photographs or texts, articles, things mm -hmm. like this. So I'm very interested in this kind of parallel of, of the text to, to the artwork, what we say about what this is, what we say about what we're doing versus what the, versus the object and these things being in parallel or in perpendicular intersecting, um, having a relationship to each other. But again, that kind of, that sort of overwhelming of this too muchness, like this mm -hmm. flow, like there's mm -hmm. too much text here. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's too many things being said. Do these things complement each other? Do these things, are these th statements in agreement? Um, this too muchness, I think, is what I relate to maybe some, to something related to uh, a fem maybe a feminine, um, you know, approach in terms of art, in terms of what I understand from the studying of feminist art history, um, where it's often related to, to, you know, the advent of installation art and things being scattered, things being, you know, it's over here, it's over there, there's an element there, you know, there's something wrapped, there's something on the floor, there's something painted. Uh, this idea of things being having um, the boundaries of, of where the work is being um, contestable or, you know, perhaps at threat, um, a certain unboundedness and flow. Um, I think these are things that are, that are associated with, um, with the kind of critical study of feminist art. So yeah, that's how I see it as being, as being related to a certain aesthetic about um, perhaps girlishness. Um, yeah. You know, that's when this too muchness, I keep, I love that and thinking about your work and specifically thinking about the presence of text in your visual artwork as this, this quality of too much, which I do associate not only with particular strategies of feminist art, but you know, sort of something specific to girlishness, which has not necessarily been embraced in the history of feminism, right? Like this idea that we're women, right? We're not girls. Like there's this sort of way in which um, we're supposed to, through our feminist maturation, um, grow up and, and, and also understandably a pushback against being infantilized by the patriarchy has kind of left girlishness as um, a somewhat, um, I think, kind of tastes, uh, tense set of qualities within feminism. But um, going back to thinking about the girlishness of this, the too muchness of your text, um, I kept thinking of both about things like, and this is an obvious reference, Paige. I'm sorry if I'm like, it's like so, so obvious, Heather, but things okay. like diaries and the, um, the bulletin boards, right, that are associated with girly bedroom culture and bedroom culture being like a big thing about what girls are supposed to, um, you know, think that things that girls are supposed to value that of course require that girls have their own private space, which there are girls that do not that share rooms that don't have bedrooms. So, you know, whose girlhood is always 
the, the question we could ask. Um, but bracketing that for a second, um, the collage-like nature of, of di some diaries or like the burn book in Mean Girls, right? And like the, the way that there's writing and there's images and all sorts of different types of writing that are there in, um, in bedroom walls with, with, um, with writing and images as well. Um, so I kept thinking about that. I mean, your work deals with girlishness in a way that isn't, that isn't just, it isn't completely obvious. But I think that might be one of the more visual aspects of kind of a girlish textual environment perhaps that I see in the, in the works that you have. And that also reminds me of text in social media, which has an obvious quality of too muchness, right? Mm -hmm. And people talk about, oh, I don't know who these people are, I guess, boomers, I'll pick on them, um, talk about how young people today, they never read. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, there's so much reading. There's so it's, much it's more text than ever. We're exactly. reading so much. I, I, think, I, so I think I read much. recently um, an article where it said, actually, we're reading more than ever before. It's just that the variety of what we're reading um, is uh, unable to be really corralled. Um, it's not hierarchical. Uh, Absolutely. Know. And the and the writing, the quality of the writing, or I shouldn't say quality, and I don't mean like value of it, but I mean, it has an, an oral quality to the writing and social media this sort of some people see it as kind of like almost like word vomit or just so many you know the threads that have comment after comment um mm -hmm. the writing on um through participatory media is often talked about as having this oral quality and in in the conversation that you and i had about about your work earlier you were talking about your interest in homer's the iliad which of course paint came out of its roots are in semi-improvised oral Greek poetry, right? And it like is really marked this, this transition into literacy, but that still is fully suffused with orality in ways that we might draw a parallel with social media um, text today, which is so strongly infantilized, if not girled. I, I would say, yeah, both feminized and infantilized this, the, um, the way that that uh, social media text is seen as improperly textual and too oral. So if you could, I would really love to hear a little bit more about this repeated presence of the Iliad and you have the sound piece where we've got this interface between text and sound, which to me has a girlish quality through my you know, network of, of associations. Mm -hmm. Well, the sound piece is um, uh, so set up from a set of tapes that um, are of a professor sort of educating you in the pronunciation of Greek poetry, um, ancient Greek, um, you know, it's, it's syllables like the structure of the language, and then how that um, informs the reading of the poetry and the rhythm of it. And, you know, it's this deep male voice, and I like its um, kind of element of that element of pedanticism even of this is how it's done. Um, you know, it's, it is like, you know, and presumably you can learn something from it, from listening to this. But to me, it was interesting as an element of um, logic and sort of structure. And, um, you know, someone saying like, this is how it works. And there is, there is a certain set, there is a system and there is met methodology in terms of how I'm arranging things. Um, you know, it's not, it's not purely intuitive. Um, there isn't there is an arranging system, but I but I realized that the the first impression of it is is not of that, and that's also intentional, and so I want to have this this other element kind of come in, that sort of attempts to maybe um, give an atmosphere of sort of like this is perfectly reasonable what's going on here like and maybe like this is like maybe this voice and this lesson is attempt to sort of get you into the rhythm of what of what's going of what's going on here. Um, you know, you can always, um, you can always sort of fuck, fuck up a system or sort of like have like it, have an element of anarchy, but if it's like, if it's negation right at the beginning, um, you know, like, like you can't really, get, it's harder to, if you want to engage with someone to like, look at something and like get and get into it, like starting immediately with like a sort of like, fuck you or negation, um, isn't, isn't as per uh, useful. What's more interesting is to have something that sort of maybe seems to be appealing or seems to bring you in or maybe has a has a pretense at least of sort of like, yes, this is all perfectly rational. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then once they're in, then they're trapped and they realize that they're just getting lost, perhaps. Um, so to me, that's interesting. It's part of sort of the tactic and kind of structuring of this sort of um, flow, which mm -hmm. is reflected in not only the kind of accumulation and accretion of materials in the works, mm -hmm. uh, but also in the imagery, how they're being juxtaposed, um, the use of marbled paper, hand marbled paper in the works, um, some of which, as I've, as I've said to some people come to the show, you know, there's hand marbled paper that I hand marbled and there's hand marbled paper that came from a store that someone else hand marbled, but there's not an authorial sort of signature per se to hand marbling as a, as a technique of um, sort of creating texture or surface. And that interests me, um, you know, there's a similarity. And, but again, it's a sort of, it's an elision of the kind of um, ex expressiveness of that mark. And it's a flow that can't quite be identified. Um, and that interests me very much. But I was also, you know, I want to go back to what you sort of said, we're saying about the cork boards in relation to this kind of privacy or maybe personal sort of um, exercise, something that's associated with diaries. And that's something I've thought um, about quite a bit. And I have interest in, in kind of hist like a mostly historical material like that, um, the, the letters of say like the Bronte sisters, um, particularly in how they wrote letters where they would cross write them, you know, it was based in the 19th century, less access to paper. So you take a letter and write, you know, vertically down the page, with, but leave enough room so that you could turn the paper diagonally and then keep writing through it. And this was a way, you know, save on paper, but also maybe to encode messages, make it a little more difficult to read and for anyone except the person who is the receiver of the letter. And that 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 interests me very much, you know, this kind of it it is it has specific information, but it's not meant to necessarily be legible to everyone. Mm -hmm. And that also that legibility can change through time. Um, you know, maybe in the 19th century, you know, a woman's handwriting, such as the Brontes, would have been may have been perfectly legible. And to our eyes today, it's not really per se. You know, I've seen exhibitions um, of, of like of letters of letters like that, including at the Brontes. And you know, I can't. It would it would take. I would you would really have to sit down and like sit and you know, take some time to to read it. And so that interests me. So then it enters the realm of, of just aesthetics, a visual form. Um, and to a certain extent, um, Emily. Dickinson's um, fascicles of her poetry function that way too. There's an exhibition of them at the Drawing Center, um, 2014 or 2015, I believe. And they have that quality as well. Um, you know, they can be legible, but it's related to, you know, this idea of scraps, scraps of text. And then the text then get, got collated later into these, into these poetry and then in typeset into, the book, into these books and distributed. But their original form were, were just like these free floating signifiers actually, you know, something you put in your pocket, you know, or should I, you know, distribute in a certain kind of um, surreptitious way, you know, they're just meant to be slipped to someone. But at the same time, what they say is very elliptical, you know, you don't read like a, a scrap of Emily Dickinson and, you know, be like, like, it's not like a tweet where someone's like, oh, I had a mental breakdown last night. You know, it's not clear. It's not, it's not confessional and, that's what I've, and that's also a term that, um, that I've thought about a lot in terms of how I use writing is there's a kind of a, a frequent sort of association of maybe writing or especially text in women's artwork or writing as um, being related to personal or to, you know, the confessional, which is an odd term to me because, you know, as someone who grew up Catholic, I understand confessional have an element of guilt associated mm -hmm. with it, you yeah. know, you're confessing something. And if you're saying something and there's no guilt intended or attached, um, then I'm then the the term is strange. Then it's sort of a projection of saying like perhaps you ought to feel guilty for saying such things. You know, um, Sylvia Plath's last poems, the Ariel poems, are often categorized this way. You know, this is confessional literature, mm -hmm. and I read them and I don't really understand that because I read them. I think really, she sounds like she's pretty enthusiastic about what she's going to do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, she doesn't sound very sorry about it it's, you know it's it's really yeah I'm gonna kill myself you know um you know as uncomfortable that, as that might make people uh I don't really read them as as confessional but it's a it's an easy tag that can get attached um to women's art um especially when it's related to narrative and to voice um and maybe to playing with signifiers of 
of personal or to history, such as textiles, embroidery, um, or writing. Right. So, I your your point about confet about confessional poetry is really well taken. When I was about maybe nineteen or twenty, and I was in. I was probably 19. I was in college and they had a guest poet of some note and he read, uh, he read our poetry. And when he got to mine, he sort of analyzed everybody's work and gave them feedback. He got to mine. He said, he said, this is confessional poetry and confessional poetry is dead. And I was utterly devastated. I like started crying. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure I had heard the term at the time. Um, I knew what he was getting at, though, I'll, and and I also likewise. There was nothing that was some sort of pr uh, expression of guilt or you know anything. I mean, I wrote it, but it it didn't seem like something that would normally have been in the darkness that was brought to light. I really felt at the time that it was because I was a woman, and it was doubly dead for a woman to do it. And I um, I I was you know really kind of. Yeah, I was sort of injured by that. And I think a lot about, I have a whole series of work on actual confessions that are, you know, really are expressions of guilt. I think that the format of the confession is super interesting and in how it hails the, uh, the viewer and the, the listener really. Um, but thinking, thinking sure. back to, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. Well, oh. yeah, it kind of um, implicates um, the reader or the listener um, or the viewer in, in something like, I mean, I like I'm inviting you in. Um, but I think the way it's functioning in my work is, um, you know, there's not, I don't think of that material as being necessarily personal, like, especially, mm -hmm. um, say, like, on these works that are um, collages on cork boards in the show, which was a, a framing device I'd used um, in a previous show in January for drawings. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of material related to our history there. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a PDF of Deleuze on there. Mm -hmm. um, there's excerpts from uh, an interview with Jack Goldstein, who's an artist um, from the 80s who died in 2003 on there. Uh, there's nothing really overtly on the surface of that, you know, and they're just printed out. Sure. There's nothing overtly on the surface that reads as personal about that per se. It's really, it's, it's, it's excerpted and like, it's dragged and dropped almost in a certain sense to use a digital term. Mm -hmm. And I think things can be in a certain sense digital uh, without necessarily being, you know, the entire work doesn't have to be constituted by a JPEG for it to be related to digital ontology. So that was how I saw the, those operating, um, not to get away from the point you were continuing. Well, and I, I love it you, that you made that point about how it doesn't have to be a JPEG to be um, an expression of a digital ontology, which is sort of what I was getting at with Girlhood and the Plastic Image and looking at things that, that like Alice in Wonderland or um, you know, sort of early Alice in Wonderland cartoons, which are, are not digital, right? But that they are embodying certain in this proto way, they are uh, foreshadowing or kind of maybe um, allowing for future possibilities of the digital um, despite their analog nature. Um, I love that. Uh, I wanna go back for a second. There's so many things that you said that, uh, that I want to talk about when looking at my notes, which I've got over here. Um, you know, the, this, this idea of like, what is the personal of the, the, the diary is supposed to be of the utmost, uh, is supposed to be extremely personal. Um, I kept a lot of books that had ripped magazine images and were full of references or actual items that were from popular culture, which is the other aspect. There's something about the, at least the trope of the girly bedroom and the walls that is both extremely cringy, you know, cringily, that's not even a word, but you know what I mean, cringe inducingly personal, but also constituted by um, media culture, which is external to the person. I think that's kind of the double bind there. Yeah. And then it's both this somehow simultaneously completely personal and yet formed by outside entities, which is one of the, and, and, and informed in a, as I discuss in Girlhood and the Plastic Image, the plastic image is participatory, right? It involves, um, it is constituted from, from the outside. And I definitely see that in your work and in those um, corkboard uh, collages, which I love. One of the little scraps of paper that you have just as a uh, there's so many references that are really interesting to me, but you have a, a printout from an article on sound symbolism that um, just if for those of you, if you are not familiar with this, 
Um, the actual printout, the, the, what's being discussed is this um, 2001 linguistic experiment where there are these made up words. One is booba and one is kiki. And they asked participants to uh, attach the words to two shapes, one that was roundish and one that was more angular. And the majority of people said booba is clearly a round shape, while kiki is clearly angular. And it was a, a sort of a revamping of an earlier uh, experiment, much earlier experiment from 1929. But what I love about this is just how the connection with words and orality to our bodies, like it makes the, uh, the, the theory is that, that our mouth, when we say booba, makes a rounder shape. When we say kiki, it's a sharper sort of, my mouth went like that. And mm -hmm. that, it's, that that's, it's related to these sort of visual shapes. So that was just, this was in pro process retrospective part one, um, where uh, Paige included this little thing with, I love the little blue highlight of that, but I, I saw that. I have a, a piece that I'm, I'm working on with someone on renaming my, my six-year-old son based on the principles of sound symbolism, which are used in advertising, actually. When they make up, there's another famous sound symbolism experiment with frozen yogurt and like what is supposed to be a, a lighter calorie frozen yogurt and what is a richer frozen treat. And I can't remember the made up words, but we can also associate light and heavy cream, I don't know, right. with these sort of sound symbolism. So I, I love that reference. That was just a, a, one of the many um, little bits of scraps of paper that uh, Paige has in, in her work, but that was great yes. for those of you curious about that. What, what drew you to that particular uh, linguistic experiment? Well, again, it kind of, well, it sort of is in parallel um, with sort of like the tape, which is, um, which is linguistic and is about kind of pronunci about pronunciation and orality. Um, yeah. But it's also in a certain sense, um, kind of like in the inclusion is sort of like a joke of the idea that like, well, any like object we see, we can be categorized into kiki or boba, mm -hmm. you know, and also, but also that this is like a similarity that regardless of what language you speak, um, mm -hmm. that, that people could, that that's a concept, people could understand this idea that, that things could be separated into categories, like that it would either be boba or kiki. If you take someone who, has, someone who speaks Chinese or someone who speaks English, and that's that somehow that this is something that could communicate universally. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's this kind of, um, it's sort of a gesture at this, at this idea of kind of, um, throwing a bone and be like, you know, see, like, this, is, this makes sense, you know, it's like this, this is a categorizing sort of method. And it, you know, in the midst of all this, almost like non hierarchical organization, here's something that relates specifically to how one might hierarchically organize things, either mm -hmm. Kiki or Boba, and then maybe start thinking about like, oh, is this like, is what I'm looking at now Kiki or Boba, you know, like, or is this, or can it be broken down into constituent parts of like Kiki and Boba? And also then the kind of ridiculousness of that, of just like that you're saying sounds like Kiki and Boba, which sounds like maybe like you were talking to a child. Mm, um, totally. There's also like, there's a little bit of an infantile sort of like flair to that, that I think that I think is, is funny to me, um, you know, and then it also being a, like a play on the fact that it's K and B. And so then that's a joke about letters like mm -hmm. alphabet, like there's other things that say K and B and like, those are part of my initials. So mm -hmm. then again, and so then that's also sort of like a little bit of a, like a kind of a play with this idea of like of the personal, be like, uh -huh. oh, yeah, just like me, K and B, yes, that's that's me, mm -hmm. you know, this idea of like of identification, you know, or recognition, like, oh, I recognize this thing, ergo, I'm drawn to that thing because I recognize mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. you know, something about, um, you know, a kind of a training of um, of your senses to sort of to identify or to, or to project onto things mm -hmm. and you know including something like including something like that is the kind of this idea of um maybe that's also that's also kind of a, sort of a playful kind of allusion to this, maybe the, the the projection or associations of girlishness that might mm -hmm. that people might bring bring to my work um you know so to have something that seems to um you know literally be making people have in their heads like these kind of like infantile sounds mm -hmm. when when they're when they're looking at the work um but at the same time quite nearby that again is you know are things pulled from art history which are not things that any which are not things that a child would know um they're, they're not things that are associated with like a knowledge base say of a of a girl um you know say like again i come back to jack goldstein because he's a work he's an artist whose work very much interests me but he's not someone who's 
particularly known, um, well known, um, even though he has more famous peers such as Cindy Sherman of his generation. Um, but he's someone who's sort of like someone that only like a real head would know mm -hmm. sort of in mm -hmm. visual art, um, someone who's like really like, you know, probably professionally involved in the field. Mm -hmm. um, his work is not necessarily well known outside of that. So that kind of juxtaposition of something like that, you know, within something like this that may, that just has you like going like Kiki and Bubba <laughs> is to me funny. Um, mm -hmm. So it implies a sort of like, again, like what is the Venn diagram here of the references, you know, where in what world am I, am I now existing, visual world am I existing in where I'm being asked to like, think, like to consider like, like both those things at the same time. And the, then the answer is, you know, is to say like, well, that's the world of my work. You know, I'm the glue, the connection between those things. Like who, who would put those things, like who would be thinking about those things? And, well, that'd be me. Mm -hmm. So in a certain sense, then that's the, that's the, like the principle under which the personal is functioning in the work, you know? Yeah. You know, Paige, thinking more about the personal as the person as collator and the personal as the creation of links, but then also what is being collated is something that is non-confessional and kind of external to the person. It reminds me of our, of the presence of character in your work as character, both as something, if not personal, it's individual, but then character, especially in, in anime, as be having a generic quality as well. If you look at um, scholarship on anime that talks about how characters in anime are these conglomerations of, of character qualities that create a certain type of uh, type of character. Um, and I see that that tension between the is it personal to page? Is it by? Is it individual authorship? Is it collective authorship? Is it is it uh, you know sort of a, an individual character? Is it a generic character? I definitely see that throughout the exhibition. So could you talk a little bit about? And then you've got specific characters like Asuka from Neon Genesis Evangelion um, that that show up in the work as well. Could you talk a little bit about your interest in character and what it's doing for this exhibition? For sure. I mean, character is interesting to me because um, it's, again, somewhat like, um, like I was talking about, like the associations with materials, um, say like, you know, a corkboard collage or like embroidery mm -hmm. that these have, you know, sort of projections associations um, that people bring to them. And characters are also, you know, kind of in a certain sense, like templates that people mm -hmm. can, can identify with. And this is used, um, you know, very deliberately um, often, you know, as you said, like in anime, um, Ano H Hideaki Ano, the creator of Evangelion, for mm -hmm. one, you know, he has, there's, I mean, there are more, there are multiple female characters in the show, but for instance, there's a sort of set of three main female characters, um, two, they're younger, um, under 18, they're minors, about they're 13 or 14, and then one who's an adult, who's an adult woman. And, you know, he said, like, you know, these, these were created, you know, to basically to appeal to, you know, the fanboys, you know, you've got the older, like, sophisticated, sexy lady who's like, has a drinking problem, you know, she's tortured. <laughs> um, and then you have like the two, the two younger girls, one who's quiet and shy and has short hair, and like, one who's fiery and like, and annoying and like, angry and has long hair. So, you know, so it's like, I, so we capture, you know, the audience base, like we capture the range of people of like, of the, of the audience. Um, you know, depending on what your taste is in terms of female characters of who, of what would appeal to you, you know, it's trying to capture market share, you know, mm -hmm. of, of attention and, and appeal. Be like, okay, here's one of each, um, you know, and then- the Booba and a Kiki. There's yeah, like, there's a, a Booba yeah, and a Kiki. Again, yeah. so like that as well, you know, here are, the, here are these tropes, here are these types. And it's very bald about that, um, and mm -hmm. that interests me. And so, the soon as but in, but people still identify with these characters. You know, people like you know this sh this particular show, for instance, came out in 1995, 1996, and people in forums have been arguing have you know the best girl argument for yeah. decades. Um, you know, being like of like, well, are you like a Ray guy, or are you like an Oscar, or are you like an Oscar guy? Like, you know, which which do you go for? And this is supposed to maybe tell you something about yourself. You know, mm -hmm. like. Yeah. qualities you prize either say in a in the opposite sex if you're if you're a man or qualities you identify with say if you're a female if you're a female viewer um and so that that interests me that being sort of an entry point or a way to kind of um 
emotionally invest yourself, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the, in the proceedings, you know, mm -hmm. this is typical of narratives be like, you know, oh, I identify with that character. That, that's really like me, you know, I can learn something from them. But, you know, I'm interested in this idea that the character in a certain set of using a character in a sense that is so um, kind of obvious and sort of default, like mm -hmm. she has sort of such a, a, almost a stereotypical personality, you know, she's an archetype of what's called like the Sundere, you know, sort of like the angry, jealous girl. Yeah. So, and, you know, and there's more, you know, I would argue, you know, well, there's more complexity to it, of course, in, in the story, um, you know, interesting things happen, but in terms of its of its function as a sign in a visual work and a still moving mm. work, you know, it doesn't really have to matter whether someone like knows that or you know knows the backstory or identifies, you know, with the story of Asuka. Um, it's more that of this idea of her as a sign and in a certain sense her, her stockness, like mm. her individuality, but also her sort of like genericism as well. Um, I think anime characters are often maybe kind of. Um, for people who are not interested or not aware or, you know, um, don't engage with it, they, they kind of like, they're sort of all the same in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of have, so, you know, when I was thinking about like, when I was using this, this image or making this work, and it's usually a particular image, like it's not sort of like all sorts of renderings of say Asuka, um, it's a very particular still. Um, mm -hmm. So a choice has been made and it's not just anime girls. It is a particular, um, particular scene and mm -hmm. particular, um, scenario like composition mm -hmm. but it's being used so and it's being used repetitively so in a certain sense it accrues significance being like mm -hmm. i'm seeing this image over and over again you know what is like so what the expression of that image is being you know is being implicated in terms of the meaning of the image um but the backstory in terms of it you know that's in a certain sense part of the implicit um content i would mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. um but you know it's something that I feel like is kind of, you know, it's not even specific to anime. It's just sort of general, something general in American culture of this kind of um, need for character, um, this need to kind of um, identify with character and project yourself. And um, a lot of the, there's this phrase I like called main character energy mm -hmm. that I think has been circulating for a bit. Yeah. Um, this idea that everyone wants to feel like they're the main character in their own story of their life. And we're encouraged mm -hmm. to see our lives as, you know, like, well, what's our goal? And like, what are the plot developments? Like we're encouraged to sort of like advance our plots. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, as Don DeLillo might say, all plots had moved deathwards mm -hmm. <laughs> in white noise, um, mm -hmm. which was also a text that was interpolated in the exhibition through mm -hmm. screening a film um, from 1987 um called dial history mm -hmm. and in a certain sense it's sort of like then that makes a kind of coincidental parallel to the fact that the still of oscar the anime character that i'm using is from a film from 1987 mm -hmm. so i'm you know so implicit again that's part of the implicit sort of subtext of the work is that i'm giving you two i'm giving you two different things but they but they come from the same time so mm -hmm. in a certain sense do they have anything to say about time do they have anything to say about you know media you know, I think, I think both of them are interesting, you know, in terms of their circulation as, as media, even though right. they circulate in very different ways um, and different registers of awareness and, you know, audience, but both those are collapsed into the same context, then what kind of media environment is being created in, you know, the space of the artwork mm -hmm. that interests me. Yeah. Well, in all, um, all stories, move towards death except Oscar continues right she continues sort of circulating in the ways that the, a lot of people have not seen me on Genesis Evangelion but they might they know the character sure um, the character as, won't go away <laughs> right it won't it's like a, yeah. a zombie I mean I love her she was the redhead so it was clear there was like a booba and a kiki there was the dark yeah. haired who was depressed and and um, mysterious and then there was the spicy redhead of which um you know I guess being a redhead I felt like that that must be me um yeah. but I, I love this this quality of um and it's also problematic in a lot of ways maybe not so much when we're dealing with anime but maybe images of you know real girls right circulating in this way outside of context and one of the things I talk about extensively in, in girlhood and the plastic image is the the seeming um invitation that images of girly creatures put out in the world that the, the idea that, oh, it's an image of a girl, so thus it can be taken out of its context and disseminated and shared and spread and circulated, which was the, the very, and, and the um, 
problematic kind of sexual aspect of that um, that move that came out in a lot of the discourse surrounding the um, Philippe, um, Pierre Puig and, and Philippe Arnaud's No Gauche Just a Shell, where that was very explicit in the art criticism about that particular work, which was about the taking of an of an anime girl, essentially a manga manga figure, and then circulating amongst artists to use it as raw material and make new works, but where that that circulation was uh, sexualized repeatedly by art critics. And, and I have a whole extensive series of quotes from art critics talking about how she was passed around or she was saved from certain death. There was the other like male savior trope of this character, which is sort of bizarre because obviously it's not a, a, a living creature, but it was kind yeah. of brought to life through the, the sharing and the participation of these art, art um, artists, but in a way that was uh, troublesome, I think, troubling. Yeah, I mean, you should see it. There's an image. If there's an image of a of a woman, or and I think even more so, uh, arguably, perhaps you agree, of of someone that reads as a girl, as a minor, um, the the way in which people feel permission and sort of entitled to use that image, especially maybe of something that looks girlish, mm -hmm. is. Um, it sits in kind of direct con contradiction with um, how kind of, um, you know, restricted a sort of access to girls yeah. like, is sort of idealized to be that, you know, that they, that they must, you know, children must be protected, like girls must be protected, like girls, like their adolescence should be extended as long as possible. If you're youthful looking, that should be extended as long as possible. Right. That's the ideal state. Um, but you know, but images of girls like it's like it's it's like an inverse. It's almost like a, an explosion of sort of the repressed of like we can't get near them. Like don't talk to them on the street. Like that's creepy. Like like stay away from them. Like they need to be like sequestered. Like their society is a separate society that needs to be sequestered and protected. Mm. And the, the oppression of that of that image is, is like explosive. That that everyone wants to engage with like with things that feel that that are that are girlish. You know, images. You know, we want to share images. We create fan art of them. Um, you know, they need, they're often, you know, the voice of Siri um, or the park mm -hmm. domain girl, like mm -hmm. an image, like a feminine image is constantly sort of being used for sort of like defaults. Yeah. Like there's a, there's obviously like this, like this very strong, almost like, you know, uh, unconscious, like psychologically unconscious desire to, to, to have the, have the feminine as, as the representative image of something that if mm -hmm. you, you can't have it physically, you know, or in a material sense, there's a kind of entitlement, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's something I'm aware of. And I, th and I think about, uh, but this, and, you know, but, and, you know, I'm interested in like every day people are kind of using like, say like Oscar, from Evangelion, like this particular character, to express like ranges of things, like maybe mm -hmm. to you know express something very personal about themselves, or maybe you know there's been this recent sort of meme trope I've noticed on Instagram just to say you know it's Thursday, Happy Thursday, and so you just post an image of uh, image of Oscar. It says and it's in Spanish for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, so you know if there's an origin, if there's a punchline of that joke, I'm not sure what the punching was. Now the, to me the punchline is just that it's Thursday. Which is very funny because it's not funny. <laughs> yeah. So just just say like, oh, it's Thursday, and then you just use Oscar, and it's fairly innocuous. Um, but again, it's like it's a it's a kind of part of visual a uh, visual vernacular language, like speaking through them. You know, this like this girl being part of your vocabulary that interests me very much, and I don't think you can necessarily you know clamp that down. Mm -hmm. um, and can be used nefariously and sort of uh, and inappropriately and in a certain to a certain degree I do think you know as you're saying about the no ghost cell project with Anne Lee you know like Pierre Huey's like sort of insistence that she's a virgin um you know is, is quite telling and mm. um yeah and Philip and notably I in terms of our criticism or about that project, um, I would say most notably Philip Noble's uh, feature in Art Forum yeah. in 2003 was fairly egregious. Um, mm -hmm. Probably because he's an architecture critic that may have something to do with it. Um, hmm. He doesn't really about that. Say, like otherwise he has no real writing about art per se. He read mm -hmm. his other clips for Art Forum were about architecture and he writes for Architectural Digest. Last I checked, he's recently pivoted to um, skateboarding. Um, so it is so, you know, in retrospect, I have to wonder, you know, what was the editorial decision to even have, you know, such a writer on, write on that project, which seems so specific to gen to gender media, um, mm -hmm. maybe Jap Japanese culture, if you want to bring that in. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, contemporary contemporary art, uh, performance, uh, collectivity, uh, mm -hmm. but none of that is really uh, meaningfully or usefully addressed. Um, right, there's phrases like, you know, we get to take her out back, you know? Yeah. Oh. There's, some, there's some really, you know, fucked up phrasing basically. And also like phrasings like Japan is seeking, like just being able to say like such a blanket statement, like a nation, like an entire culture, Japan is seeking and like her anime is tragic at its root. You know, these are very um, incredibly bold statements to make. And, mm -hmm. and he also, and he specifically even defends his saying like, you know, it's okay to use the general because, you know, because the symmetry is so ubiquitous. Like, it's okay for me to say such a generalization such as Japan is seeking. So mm -hmm. it's like, he knows, he's like, ah, no, I know you're gonna think this problem back. Don't worry, it's fine. It's, it's not fine, actually. <laughs> Your argument does not prove that it's fine. Um, so I don't think, yeah. a, a, to, to be fair, I don't think a, a piece like that would be published today, um, but nor does that excuse the fact that it was published that way in the first place. Yeah, well, it's true. I mean, I think that critics, I also see them as being conscripted into this performance of animating this girl character through circulation. So not to say that critics had no say in that, I would, I would certainly never write, and I didn't, you know, I wrote, I, I pretty much castigated the piece and the criticism in, in my own writing, but it's like this collective performance of animation through the sharing of an image that even art criticism participated in kind of gleefully in a lot of, uh, in a lot of different articles about bringing her to life um, <clears throat> through either some sort of suggestion of sexual violation or through this, we're saving her from certain death at the hands of Japanese media. It was a very bizarre uh, kind of, uh, narrative there, like Japanese media is going to kill her off and we're going to save her, mm -hmm. um, which is, is, is strange, but, um, but, but super interesting, I think for our, our purposes and what's happening with character and how characters are, there's such an investment in characters as both being iconic of a certain type of individual, but then also collectively shared and generic, the, the idea that we see this with brand characters all the time. They, they're gen generic. Hello Kitty is the perfect example. It's just like some circles, right? So generic that you can project anything onto Hello Kitty. Who's to like anything will fit, right? That's the most generic, most flexible, like all booba and just round circles everywhere. And that there's the, the quality of that in a lot of different characters of, of a kind of, and, and even in, in Neon Genesis Evangelion, those characters, especially with Ray, being sort of mysterious to the point of, is there anything going on in there? It's like sort of empty, a, a vacuity that 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 I feel like media culture loves empty girl characters because they can be filled with any number of things. Um, so that's uh, that's something that's really interesting to me. Um, so I don't know if you want to open it up to questions or how you would like to do that. It did occur to me that I was. I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, um, no, I mean, um, well, I feel like I'd like to kind of respond to that. Yeah, please, please. Sorry. sorry. Like the emptiness or like the manipulation because it is something I'm aware of. And I think the way I think about it in terms of say like how I use this particular image in this show and some other works is um, again, it's like, it's, it's, it's the same one. It's, it's repeated. Um, it's of a, it's of a specific still and um, specifically to describe it it's um sort of like of her like kind of open mouth sort of falling mm -hmm. down so like kind of the hair is sort of going up and like she's sort of like falling like towards the ground and there's sort of this like expression of like total joy um and um this is sort of this is cited in the text of the show um this is the like the happiest like we in terms of the arc of the story this is the happiest i think we ever see this character um and then other things happen um which are you know quite violent but which um i have no in particular interest in sort of rendering or referencing per se um because that like as, as taken out of the context, say, of like, you know, this particular media and its story, you know, for those, for those images to circulate, those would be related to kind of depicting like a sort of, like a, like a girl, like an image of a violated girl in a certain sense. Yeah. And, um, you know, as like with uh, the Anne Lee project, which sort of always had this implicit sort of like violate, like implicit to explicit sort of violation of like, we're going to use her, we're going to do whatever we want. And like, you're, you know, Philip Noble saying like, you know, she should be shown like the Taka Takashi Murakami like semen stream sculpture, like that would just be good sense, you know, it would be the highlight of her short life, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm very wary of using 
like this of using an image or a character like that and um, creating any kind of reiteration in terms of visual art mm -hmm. of something of, of a media image like that because mostly because it just doesn't really interest me um, and I think it doesn't interest me because it doesn't serve um, you know my my conceptual interests um, what I think it does serve um, or reflect or speak to actually is um, this part in the, your book where you were talking actually specifically about um, Sergei Eisenstein, what he wrote about Disney, mm -hmm. and he was talking about um, plasmatic meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you could give a, a summary again of like of how he of how he termed that. Um, yeah, um, Sergei Eisenstein was obsessed with Disney, the filmmaker and film. Um, theorist he like loved he loved disney which is surprising um but uh yeah and eisenstein i agree i see in the side chat eisenstein on disney is such an amazing text says david M. I absolutely agree i love it so much but he was dealing with this idea of plasmaticness is trying to identify what is it about and he ascri he ascribed it to disney but some of his examples were ones that were not animated by the Disney studio. So it was kind of like a weird thing, but what he loved in cartoons with this, this ability for a figure to take any form, that is how Eisenstein saw it, that there was no set form. And he saw this as pushing against, as he called it, the time lock mechanism of American life, which was this uh, reference to the assembly line, right? Like the rigidity of the assembly line and of just a series of the same thing um, that uh, is uh, arranged in time in this way that was, there was a lot of, we see that in a lot of different films of the assembly lines effect on the body and that these plasmatic cartoon characters were um, liberating to, uh, to factory workers when they watched them because they saw these characters that were constantly shifting and were, they had no, almost no bones at all. Like they weren't rigid. They weren't turned into like mechanical um, creatures. Um, if they were turned into mechanical creatures like we saw with um, some uh, uh, actually a lot of Mickey Mouse shorts, they would be turned that they, they would go to from uh, a mouse to a sort of mouse robot back to a mouse again, right? They weren't held to a particular form. And he saw that as politically enabling, um, which I, I love this idea. Um, so yeah, that's plasmaticness according to Eisenstein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then you also had mentioned that like his example of this um, that he uses to kind of like to illustrate his point is of um is of a girl who's a pyromaniac, um, mm -hmm. who has like it's some psychological case study of a of yeah. a girl who has you know just a desire to burn things, burn things down. Is very attracted to this and desires this, um, and is specifically a minor, and you know in a certain sense I feel like that 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 is kind of a parallel then with with that image in terms of that still that mm -hmm. that I've sort of, mm -hmm. that I've kind of um, appropriated. Um, appropriation has a kind of, um, it's a, has a particular advance in terms of cultural appropriation now, um, mm -hmm. but I've always interested in the kind of, um, you know, a lineage of appropriation in art, which, which has to do with, um, you know, which has to do with circulation. It has to do with um, reflecting a sort of your time, reflecting a media environment. Um, it has more to do with um, power dynamics, I think. Mm -hmm. And it might be arguable that, um, you know, this, um, you know, in terms of, you know, you could racialize it and say like, well, there's like a power of like you maybe as like a white artist to take like, you know, something from like a Japanese like anime and use it. Um, but, you know, I think there's other dimensions to it that like, you know, Evangelion is a globe is like a globalized media property. Um, its creators have been wildly successful. They've recently remade the films, um, you know, this is uh, something that is a cash cow. Um, I will probably never, you know, be as, uh, you know, in terms of my profit margins, as far as I will probably never be as like wildly successful as um, the people who have been involved in, or profit from Evangelion and like all its merchandised media properties. Um, so in a certain sense, I don't, I, I see like that, like, you know, there's a certain, I think there's a, there's a more complicated sort of dynamic in terms of power, um, one might argue. Um, in terms of that borrowing and that appropriation. But to get back um, to what I was saying about from Eisenstein is, um, you know, that's a still of someone who's, you know, is maybe associated with like the fiery personality or like, or this is like the passionate character, you know, the redhead, da, da, da. So there's like, like you know, that's a trope. Um, but in terms of if I'm if you're looking at work and like a contemporary arc, you know, that's related to kind of digital ontology and using things for digital media and, and circulate them and like changing the size and like reiterating them, you know, I think that relates to circulation, to posting, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, 
in terms of a history of that, then I think it's then, you know, in terms of tech, a kind of a sort of textual sort of understanding of that gesture, I think it does, it can go back to Eisenstein, you know. Mm. And so if that's the examples of a girl's a pyromaniac, well, then that fits perfectly with Asuka, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So again, that's, you know, that's subtextual, that's part of like the implicit content of, of, that, of that work. Um, and then, the, and then, but it also exists, you know, on on another on another level. Like, I'm always aware that you know, someone can like look at it, that image and just be like, oh, like, oh, look, it's Oscar. Like, I like that, you know. Ergo, I like looking at this thing because I like her. Or even they don't know anything and be, might say like, oh, like anime. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Like, that's a cool thing. I don't really know that myself, but I know it's cool. So you know, I so maybe I you know I have someone saying that oh, okay, this is like a cool artist who's doing stuff with you know you know, media or whatever, they're into pop culture, you know, mm. not like I'm aware that that's like, a, that's like a read as well. And you know, that's just something that you kind of, that you roll with, like things always exist on multiple levels. Um, but then that, like, again, like the example of the girl, the pyromaniac, then that relates to the other motifs visually in the show, which mm -hmm. is there's all this like scatterings of ash. Um, mm -hmm. There's a constant sort of reiteration of this of this line, um, what's a fire and why does it, what's the word burn, mm -hmm. which happens to in fact come from a Disney song from a 1989 film, The Little Mermaid. And that's not because I particularly give, you know, care about The Little Mermaid. Um, it's not necessarily significant, like that's not really the point. Um, I was interested in it for its rhetorical qualities. Um, how it, you know, it's poetic, um, but also might relate to kind of a scientific problem, like what are the properties of fire? Like, how, how does that work? How does that function? Um, and I think there's something mechanical in terms of how I'm often repeating and recirculating imagery or, or texts. Like there's a kind of mechanicalness of like, of kind of going through things and be like, okay, cut this out here, put this there. Like this repeats here. Like now this is like, now it's scanned, now it's embroidered. It's just a different material. There's a real like mechanic, just sort of like kind of like, you know, hammering something, something into place or like this goes here to, to, to arranging, you right. know, it's, um, it's not gestural painting. I mean, there's, there's painting involved, there's sure. um, on, on the works, um, but you know, it's not expressionistic. It doesn't have that. It specifically avoids, I think, those kinds of qualities because mm -hmm. I'm interested in making a viewer aware of a certain level of constructiveness because they yeah. are very, you know, it's not, there's an intuition driving things, but you know, it's not, um, it's not unconscious. It's not, oh, this image just came out. I don't know where this is going. No, like you see it repeated. So you're aware that like, you know, that like things are being applied. Mm -hmm. Like it's again, and that's sort of related to digital, digital, digital vocabulary as well, like applications. It's, mm -hmm. it's like that in a certain sense, like things are being applied rather than, you know, oh, this just came out, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was lost in the flow of the painting, you know, the flow's there, but the flow has, you know, I bought it this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I, I love that. We talked about the logic of the cover in our previous conversation, right? We're maybe even thinking outside of appropriation to a cover, like doing a cover of a piece of music, like how that might, in music, you never, people aren't, aren't necessarily, well, they, they are a, a that people are can be accused of cultural appropriation. That is an important discussion, um, even within music. But there's a, a different sense of what is takeable when it comes to music. And musicians tend to have a different sense in terms of doing a cover of another musician, another composer, um, another artist's song, right? And that maybe your work functions using the logic of the cover, which might in some way be different from the early 2000s idea of the remix. Not that that's not relevant now, but there's a lot of scholarship on the remix that came out at that time. Maybe the cover is slightly different. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, of how cover might be different from appropriation and different from remixing. Um, I have thought about this. I was thinking about, I think about it in terms of like iterations and appending, mm. you know, um, maybe to kind of elaborate what I mentioned earlier about appropriation. Appropriation has to do with kind of taking something wholesale and just sort of like it was here, now it's here. Um, mm. Say like, maybe like, without much modification. So I'm thinking like, you know, Richard Prince's paintings of like the Marble Man, something like that. Right. Um, but in terms of, but cover logic, I think of it as being, you know, something that has, that has a tether, but sometimes it's, it's, it's not obvious. And like, there's an element of time related to it where it, may, where it might take you like some time to realize like, 
wait, I, I've seen this thing before. I have heard this thing before. Um, but sometimes there's maybe like a cue that, that points you to it. Um, you know, I think of like, I feel like a, a good touchstone is like, you know, the cat power record, like the covers record, mm -hmm. you know, there's no chorus of like this, like very recognizable, like Rolling Stone song, um, you know, like if that's gone, like what's left there's a sort of like there's something that's been evacuated there's something that's been taken out there's other things that are that are there like the, the structure has been has been changed you know there's been modifications um mm -hmm. and now it kind of sits next to next next to something next to the original there's a relationship to it but in what sense how much how much does the the relation between this idea of like this being an original and this being you know something something else like is it is this does this remain original you know and that's a great example of like for only sense like original it's just like well that was like you know black people's blues music and so right. but that's like that's like rock and roll so it's like this whole yeah. idea of like you know the original the original anyways is so fraught as as is um and you know and i think and i can feel like we can think about that in terms of visual art as well mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that that artists, you know, from past centuries would have had such ideas about kind of about originality. The originality was, you know, the style, maybe like the application, uh, the technique, the approach. I think about approach. I think about style. Um, I'm not sure about, but they were working with tropes. You know, well, I, I can do these portraits. I can do a landscape. I can do a still life. Do, you know, you're working with like these like genre and like in genres. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is a it's a little bit more of a simplification of, you know, a history of Western art, which I'm not so so much attempting to make here, but more just to make a point about um, that I think there's it's a kind of modernist um, kind of um, sort of concern and sort of um, kind of frightfulness around this idea of like, oh, who does this belong to? Like, right. where does this belong? You know, what is this thing? You know. How, how clear is it and where does it go and who owns it? Like that's related to copyright law, which was, you know, and later, you know, it's the 20th century. So as far as I understand it, you know, it's a fairly recent development historically um, or just of modern copyright law. And, you know, I just think about like Mike Kelly saying like, you know, actually copyright is quite bad for art. Um, you know, we all, we should all have a right to respond to the culture around right. us. Um, you know, we should be able to record and manipulate and, and change and work with things that, you know, visually, you know, media is, and culture is giving us things all the time. Like we're constantly being like lambasted with images right. and with text, you know, this idea that's like, okay, but, but, no, don't don't touch it. Like we're just broadcasting at you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's it's it's a little it becomes more and more difficult to kind of ma maintain that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are limitations and complications, of course, um, when it comes to this idea of like, you know, things that have association or, or native origin, um, or particularly with, with groups of people, you know. And so, you know, there's respect, of course. Um, but there's also something about this idea of of how. You know, there's an anxiety about how I think like how widespread like cultural signifiers maybe from other, from different places like have become um, how like how much they've sort of blend in through through different places and circulate and like at, through globalization. Um, but at the same time, like people like actual physical bodies of people are becoming, um, you know, their circulation is, if anything, becoming maybe more constrained um, through borders, um, you know, refugee crisis, places becoming mm -hmm. unlivable, climate change and such, um, you know, at the same time as, as cultural images and sounds and styles, you know, become unable to, you know, really be controlled. I think there's an anxiety, there's an anxiety again, it's sort of like as people be, become maybe less free and mm -hmm. culture becomes more free there's an anxiety about, well, what, what, what can anyone hold on to? Like what belongs mm -hmm. to anyone, you know? And I think there's, you know, there's power dynamics and different power dynamics involved with that, you know, city of like, who, where do we, where do we belong? Where does anyone belong? Right. What is anyone entitled to? And, you know, that's, yeah. those are large, those are larger questions. I would say. When the internet facilitates that kind of sharing, but it also facilitates research that allows us to trace something's provenance back to a particular group right uh cult. so it's it sort of does both 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 things um you know this these are certainly really they are really big issues and and i i was very aware of it in writing girlhood in the plastic image and that uh, i 
I do not speak Japanese. I'm not a trained Japanese studies scholar, although I have done, I was encouraged by Japanese studies scholars with my research. I tried it out on them, on my research on anime. And actually my most cited work is, has been my um, research from this book on the shoujo, the um, the the girl figure in anime. And um, so it's sort of this, I, I'm somewhat, uh, un- I've always been uncomfortable about it because I don't, I'm not steeped in Japanese culture in the way that someone who has that kind of training is. And I'm more of a media theorist and an, and an artist, but um, it once it was circulated, my work has been circulated by Japanese studies scholars that give it, give it that kind of, um, you know, thumbs up of approval. So mm-hmm. um, that's sure. now I'm known as being a scholar of anime, which is, which is, you know, super fun and surprising to me. Yeah, but I mean, your research draws on and cites like many Japanese scholars um, and and non-Japanese scholars as well. But I think there's a there's a wide there's a widespread interest. Um, I mean, maybe not just in terms of an academic sense, but I think there's a gl- there's such a global interest in anime. And you know, I always point to the fact that um, you know, if if the conversation goes on long enough, I I like to bring up that. Um, you know, I actually have read industry reports like from the Japanese animation industry and, you know, year over year, like their growth sector is in overseas markets, mm. you know, like it's, it's a, it's an industry, like this is not a niche, like subculture, like it's a, it's a huge like commercial boom mm-hmm. and the, you know, the people who are on the board of, you know, this like of this, of, you know, the body that is producing these reports, they're all from like the large animation studios. And, you know, year over year, they're saying like, you know, this is our gross sector. We want people, you know, they want people to have this. They want people to buy this thing. You know, there's a, there's a global interest in this. Like, that's what also interests me is that I may be able to go to all sorts, any number of countries. And maybe just like, if I show someone like an image of like Asuka, like, be like oh yeah, like we know what that thing is. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's interesting to me. So in a certain sense, then that becomes a language language it's a certain globalized language yeah so it may have an origin in a particular place and say a creator like Hideaki Anno but you know I think he and he probably understands very he probably understands way too well how much like this thing like in a certain sense like doesn't belong to him even and you know and that's kind of part of sort of the lore around Evangelion is you know that he sort of like you know, had problems, you know, personal problems with like finishing the show and like that also really the budget problems, but that so much of his life, like so much of, like this, like part of his life has been about, you know, this idea of like, you know, what do like the Evangelion fans want, you know, how, yeah. you know, I felt like I failed to give it to them and, or, or, you know, or we couldn't do it the way I wanted to and everyone's angry at me now. Here's another version of it. And people of course, angry about that too. <laughs> um, and also people loved it, but you know, that's, it, to me, it's interesting because that's in a certain sense a meta sense kind of like also what Evangelion is about mm. at this point is this idea of kind of like attempting to sort of satisfy mm. people like mm-hmm. satisfy their their desire for more Evangelion like people want it so much you know they recently remade the whole series as a new series of films that yeah. included like in just in the past couple of years after years totally of- it's really confusing I I was like I'm, I'm not understanding it because they compressed the storyline but yes they did yeah so in a certain sense you know there's a like people want it they they like the the the, the desire for Evangen is is seemingly bottom like endless like more and more and more like we want to like keep to recirculate we want to like keep going to the story like we want to keep watching it. we want to keep enjoying it we want to like more images also great like have her give her an eye patch give her a slightly modified outfit great fantastic you know um so and so, so that that interests me, you know, that mm. there's not um there's not this isn't really a precious image. Um, mm-hmm. It's really one that is designed to to go global. Absolutely. Um, you know, or if it wasn't designed that first place, it is now, and its mm-hmm. creators understand that, and you know, and that's fine. Like that's if anything, that's encouraged. You know, that's that's a that's a something that's being serviced and kind of mm-hmm. supplied for. You know, it's not um. I say it's like it's not a it's not a kimono in the national museum in Mm -hmm. in japan Mm -hmm. you know this is something else it's not a unesco world heritage Mm -hmm. site um so for what it's worth that's that's part of my perspective in terms of my usage and kind of engagement with this material which i think is important to be um thoughtful about absolutely um, but yeah, so if anyone does have any questions, um, 
David seems to have a few comments, um, mm -hmm. which are super helpful. Um, Thank you for that shout out about the Jack Goldstein lobby at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Vegas. That's incredible. I must go to Vegas now. I had no idea that that was the case. Um, yeah, if anybody who's attending, um, I think you can raise your hand and I can uh, allow you to speak if you do have questions. It's also fine if people don't as well. <laughs> would they be able would they be able to type them in or is there like a way to uh, oh here we go. Sorry, just in question? fan mode. <laughs> um people would be able to raise their hand, but I think that um I think everyone's just floored. Um thank you both so much for speaking and, and allowing us into your conversation. And um, yeah, thank you, Paige. Cool, thank, thank you. you. No, I had, this um, was such a fun opportunity and it was, I was really um, happy to be exposed to your work, Paige, and, and, and be able to uh, chew on it for a while. It's wonderful work. Congrats on the exhibition. Thank you. And I'm glad that, I'm glad that someone read this book that I wrote. So that's always, <laughs> I always get, I'm like, wow, and, somebody read it. They read my book. So. And, and, and more people should for sure. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's a really relevant text for anyone who kind of wants to think about like specifically about anime in terms of history of kind of, um, of in terms of media studies, in terms of visual art, um, in terms of how it's maybe been used in contemporary art in, in a particular way. And maybe then that, how those critiques might inform how it might be used in a maybe more interesting or just be part of, you know, contemporary art in, in a more interesting generative way in the future, so. Awesome. All right, thank, thank you. you both. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. To... Bye. All right, bye. bye.